Okay, just before we do this uh, last hour, there are some really important things I want to remind you of. Uh, next uh, week we will start the intensive testing period just before the bar. And during that intensive testing period, we, it is really, really important that you treat this just like the bar exam, that you answer your essay questions in one, one hour only. That don't, at the end of the hour, don't keep on writing and saying, here's what I would have written if I had more time. If you mess up your time like that on the bar and end up with 40 minutes to do the third question, okay, that's a disaster. Okay? And you have to start training yourself against that disaster now. Okay? You cannot wait to do that now. We've, we've delayed uh, requiring that you finish within one hour on purpose so you can help get the law right and so forth. That's over. Okay, starting with this practice, the intensive testing period, you must finish within one hour. Force yourself on all your practice questions from now on. Force yourself to finish within one hour. And if you stop at the one hour and send it in and get this horrible grade because you had another ten minutes worth of stuff you want to write, if you stop and send that in, that will psychologically force you to start looking ahead better so that at the 20, 30, 40 minute mark you see that you're going to run out of time and you start doing things that are appropriate for that. Okay, continue. You've got to learn to get good factual analysis on it. Lots and lots of factual use and good law and still finish on time. This is a tight squeeze. If you wait until bar exam to start doing that, that is a screw-up. Don't do it. That's a disaster. Start now with these exams and finish them in one hour. At the end of one hour, stop, send it in, and see how awful your grade would have been. If you want to write some other stuff, put it on another sheet of paper. Don't even send it to us. Okay, we are the bar examiners. We don't want to see your stuff you do after one hour. So please stick to that rule. Secondly, remember that the bar is about rules and facts. What is the rule that deals with this problem? And have you got the facts to satisfy the rule? Rule application is the way we say it casually. And so give them a rule and then start arguing about whether you got the facts and make good use of these facts. So you use them and look for anything you can say. Are the facts enough? They may be not enough. The other side is going to say something else about the facts. Use your facts. Use two-sided arguments wherever that's appropriate. Two-sided arguments are worth much more than a very extensive one-sided argument. Okay? Two-sided arguments wherever there are two sides. In, in almost every question, in every question on the bar, every essay question, there are at least three places on every essay question. There are at least three places where the lawyers will interpret the facts differently. And if you don't find those three places and argue both sides of that, it will cost you points. So rule application is what it's all about. Give them a rule separately, application of those rules. Uh, the, uh, uh, the third, uh, finish in one hour, stick to the rule application process. As it's true for the performance test as well as the essays. For the performance exam, finish in three hours. Okay? You must finish in three hours. What you do during the fourth hour is nonsense. Okay? The bar examiners won't get it. We don't want it either. Okay? We're going to treat you like people taking the bar at the end of one hour. This is a, you know, a, you, you just got to stop. You have to have that. If you're serious about passing the exam, you know you've got to finish in three hours. So don't mess around with that. Finish and stop in three hours and send us what you got. If it ain't finished, that's too bad. Send it anyway. Next, I want you to know that next week when we're grading these final, uh, final intensive period, uh, we're going to treat you like the bar examiners. We're going to grade those papers right away and send them back to you. Now, there are a number of people who have waited to get, to get their homework written uh, exercises done, and they've delayed them, and so there are a few people we haven't done much of anything on homework, and they're going to do it now. 
but you send us all that homework at the last minute, and you've got to understand it's going to get a lo much lower priority. The practice exams are going to get the highest priority. We'll get to the homework as quickly as we can, but it's coming in very late, and we'll do the best we can. But that's, you know, we, we're not going to be able to keep up with homework that's coming in two and three and four weeks late, uh, even one week late. For the price, for the exam, the, the exams next week are going to get our highest priority. Everything else is going to get second priority. We'll do it. We'll do it as fast as we can, but that's the priority for next week. So uh, stay on schedule, rule application. Every essay has at least three points of, uh, where there are points of contention. You can argue both sides, stick to rule application, uh, and uh, do a good job. Get ready for this exam. If you take next week's practice testing seriously, so you treat it just like the bar. You start on time and you finish on time. If you do that, you'll do much better on the bar than if you think, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to treat it seriously later. I'm going to get to the bar and that's the first time I'm going to treat this seriously. Please don't do that, okay? Treat this exam seriously next week. It's a serious part of the program. We spend a lot of money to give you this opportunity to do what is a series of practice exams just as though you were taking the bar. And if you brush it off and don't treat it like a series of practice exams, there's no point in doing it. You're just going to do some homework, treat it like homework again. Don't do it, okay? Get yourself out of bed, get down there at your desk and start at 9 o'clock and write the, uh, write the exams just like you would under the bar. That will improve your, your grade much better when you don't know the law do the best you can, like you will under the bar exam. Look up the law later. Okay, look it up later, but do the best you can and finish in one hour. Okay, enough of my harassment about that. But this is important. We want you to pass the exam, and there's no point in having this week if you're going to treat it like homework. Okay, don't treat it like homework. Treat it like the exam. Okay, and the, we expect your essays in the morning, we expect them to be here by 1 o'clock. The three essays that you write in the morning, we want, we want them by 1 o'clock. There's no reason we shouldn't have them by 12.15, actually. <clears throat> but get them in here no later than 1 o'clock. And for the uh, PTs in the afternoon, if you're doing those from 1 to 4, they should be here by 5. We want them by 5 o'clock. Don't send them by 7 and 8 o'clock because you're not taking this whole process. You're not taking it seriously. Okay? And if you're taking the exam seriously, take this process seriously. It's like taking studying for running a you only run a twenty six mile marathon and you, you don't take the you don't take the practice seriously. No, don't do that. Okay. That uh, brings us in down to a one point eight. One point eight of the ADA rules. is a particular rules about conflict, and 1.8a, there's a whole bunch of these uh, subsections in the 1.8, so it's all the way to 1.8l, uh, a through l. And so uh, some of these are pretty obvious, but there are a few of them that we need to talk about. And we're going to end up running over a little bit today because I do want to do some problems with these rules once we have gone through the rules. 1.8a, a lawyer shall not enter into a business transaction with a client uh, or knowingly acquire an ownership interest or possessor interest or security interest uh, that is adverse to the client uh, unless uh, the transaction is fair, disclosed. Sorry, am I reading? Yeah. Okay. That read just like the ADA rules. Add three dash Yeah, so the thing is three dash three hundred. So uh, one point eight A 
when point point A is about uh, getting making deals with your clients, and we already had that over here on uh, uh, three over here. Um, three dash three hundred on this board, and um, three dash three hundred is when you have client lawyer deals, and in client lawyer deals you have these three requirements that we talked about, and over here at one point eight, it's uh, the uh, and this is the client lawyer deals for deals. Deals with the client, business deals in other words. And this is at 3-300, we've already covered that. Item B, 1.8B, um, do not use the information to the disadvantage of your client, B. Don't use the information to the disadvantage of your client, and we already talked about that in 3 dash uh, three, um, sorry, three dash, should be three dash three hundred. Get that section for you here in just a second. Don't use the information to the disadvantage of your client. Should have been at 3 310E, but RC, I'm looking on the wrong page. Yeah, 3 310E. Solicit substantial gifts. 1.8C. Do not solicit substantial gifts from your client unless they're related. That's so it says no substantial. Don't do not solicit substantial gifts. So I'm, I'm abbreviating here on the board. And please understand that you know this stuff gets tested. There's going to be a TR question, so learn exactly what the rule says. And what it says is do not solicit substantial gifts. This includes testamentary gifts from your client. Don't solicit them. And the California rule about that is that uh, such an... Uh, um, oh, this, I'm sorry, I need to back up for a second. There's something I forgot to do. Over here, we talked about 3 310, and we said 3 310 uh, was basically the set of rules that said the same thing here. Don't uh, do all the bad things that happen over here. We talked about those. The one we didn't talk about was 3-320. And let me talk about 3-320 for a moment right now. Okay, 3-320 is the case where the lawyer, uh, we talked about the case where if the lawyer has a, if the lawyer is representing, um, if the lawyer is representing one person, that they can have economic business conflicts with this person, but they can also uh, have um, uh, an interest. Let me see, where are we? With 3 320. Yeah, that if you say 3 310 says, if you have any kind of relationship, so the person is hiring you, and if you have some kind of relationship 
for the person you're suing or some witness in the lawsuit. You have to disclose that. But also, if you have some kind of relationship with a lawyer on the other side, and that's what 3-320 is about. It says, uh, if you have a relationship with a lawyer on the other side, then you have to disclose that also. If that lawyer on the other side is your sister, your brother, your parent, your cousin, your significant other, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, if you have any kind of relationship such as that uh, with a lawyer on the other side, 3-320 says you must disclose that also. That's 320. Uh, and finally, 3-400 doesn't surprise you. It says don't try to limit 3-400. Don't try to limit your liability. You cannot have a contract with your client that limits your liability. Okay, these are the sections that we have to pick up, but they're pretty obvious what they are. 3-320 and 3-400. Now, I want to go back to over here. And this says, don't solicit substantial gifts from your client. And uh, this is at 1.8c. The California counterpart to soliciting substantial gifts from your client is in, uh, is actually in section 4. And it's at... Uh, Four dash four hundred says essentially the same thing. Uh, and uh, by, by the way, both of these exclude relatives. You know, if it's your close relative and you want them to include you in the will, well, you can ask about that. I mean, that's okay. Uh, but uh, it's a non-relative where you can't do that. The uh, 1.8D, 1.8D says, prior to conclusion of the suit, don't try to get the literary or uh, rights, so no literary rights before the suit is all over. Uh, there's not a specific California rule on point, but don't do it. 1.8E. 1.8E says that uh, if you are um, the uh, if you're going to provide financial assistance to someone, that uh, you cannot. I'll read it to you. A lawyer shall not provide financial assistance to a client in connection with a pending contemplated litigation, except. Uh, you can advance litigation fees out of uh, a contingency arrangement, and if you're representing an indigent client, you can do it. Contingency and indigent clients. So do not advance money to clients. Except these two cases, contingency cases and indigent cases. And the California rules say essentially the same thing, uh, but um, they add 4 210. And 4 210 is a little bit different. It says that you can loan money to your client. Okay, you can loan money to your client if you have a written promise to pay it back. So you, you, you have all this stuff here, but you can you can loan money with a written promise to repay. The 4 210 says that. And then um, 4 the F, section F, uh, says if you have a third party payer, uh, that in these cases of a third party payer, you need a client, have, you need client's consent, uh, and um, 
that don't let the other side that, that, um, uh, see that sweet where are we 1.8 e says if you have if some if you're a third party payer third party pay of these three requirements, the same ones we talked about before, that is, uh, get client's consent, don't tell the other person about secrets, and um, don't let them control your case. Now this uh, 1.8F is covered under the California rules at 3-310F. I think we had 3-310F over here, we just didn't didn't write all that stuff out on the board. Well, over here, when we were talking about 3-310, right here, we talked about it, 3-310F says the same thing. And so, let's go back to this other board. And over here, this is 1.8F. 1.8F is at, I'm going to write it here because I don't have room over there. I'm going to uh, erase this. Try to write a little larger. Yeah. Third party promise to pay. This is at three dash three ten F. Okay. This brings us to uh, we finished with one point. No, we have one point eight G. One point eight G. Now I don't have more room on the board, so I'm just going to tell you about these few remaining rules. 1.8G says a lawyer who represents two or more clients shall don't uh, make aggregate settlements. Okay, you can't agree to an aggregate settlement. Uh, your clients have to, you have to work that out with the clients so that each person knows how much they're going to get. And uh, 1.8H, don't try to limit your malpractice. Well, don't try to limit your malpractice is the same in the California rules that uh, that is covered at um, um, sorry. Trying to limit your malpractice is at three dash four hundred. So one point eight um uh, 1.8 H 1.8 H says don't try to limit your malpractice whereas California 3-400 says the same thing don't try to limit your malpractice and then 1.8 J 1.8 J I'm not putting these on the board anymore I'm out of space but you can follow these easily 1.8 J don't have sex with your clients unless you already had a sexual relationship with them before you started, um, before you uh, uh, had the had the started representing them. The California counterpart to that reads a little bit differently, but be sure to pay attention to uh, what it says, and that is at three dash one twenty. Three dash one twenty is about sexual relations with your client, whereas under the ABA rules, it is at 1.8 I. And that, that was tested uh, in um, two exams ago, a couple of exams ago. Um, now to 1.8 J. 1.8 J, don't have sex with your clients unless, and 3 120. Then 1.8 K. Um, Uh, 1.8K is no surprise. Uh, it, uh, it says um, all of this, well, there's the 1.8K, I said it went to L, it only goes to K. 1.8K says what's said about one lawyer applies to the whole firm. That doesn't surprise you at all. So that takes care of 1.8, and that brings us to the last of these, which is 1.9. 1.9, again, we don't have room on the board for 1.9, but I'll tell you what it says. In fact, 
you should turn to 1.9 and see what it says. But 1.9 is very important in that what it says is that uh, can you sue the person who used to be your client? Can you sue your former client? I don't mean personally, but can you represent somebody who is suing your former client? And the rule is at 1.9a, and the answer is no, you cannot do it if the matter is, if this, if, I'll read it to you, if it's exactly what it says, because this gets tested a lot. So 1.8, 1.9 says, a lawyer who has formally represented a client shall not thereafter represent somebody else in the same or substantially related matter when the person's interest is materially adverse to the former client. Now, the key words here are same or substantially related matter. You've got to memorize those phrases. Same or substantially related matter in which their interests are materially adverse. So your new client comes along, wants you to sue the old client. You cannot do it if it's the same or substantially related matter and their interests are materially adverse. The, uh, uh, and uh, that pretty much is the way that goes. So that takes us to 1.9. The, uh, again, it is very important that you actually read these rules, both the California and the ADA rules. Now the rules, as I pointed out to you earlier, the rules 1.1 through 1.9 of the ADA rules and their California counterparts are the parts, rules that which are most heavily tested. However, uh, you, you should read the ADA rules starting at 1.10 all the way to 8.5. It's only, you know, 10, 15 pages of reading and just read, not even that much, I don't think. But read the rest of those rules and read all of the California rules. Be sure that you are familiar with those. And secondly, try to use the language of the rules, not your, your kind of your biblical language or your, your you know, tarot, tarot language or tarot, whatever it's called, and, or, you know, or the Bhagavad Gita or whatever your, your moral language may be. They're not looking for that language, they're looking for the legal stuff. So learn the legal language here and try to express yourself in these words. Now let's look at a couple of problems and see how to put this stuff to use. What we want to do with these problems is we want to look at the problem and we want to identify the, uh, identify the issue and see what the, uh, identify the particular rule by rule number that deals with that issue. And let's begin with the problem um, of a good good problem for us to begin with is uh, from the February 95 bar. In the February 95 bar, uh, I'm going to put that analysis on this board because I don't have another board and that's I think all the room that I have, I've got to choose some place. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to erase this board and use this. So we're going to use the problem from February 95. And let's go through and do the analysis together. February 95, uh, it says, again, as we read these, we want to identify the problem, identify the problem, and identify the particular ABA or California rule which addresses that problem. So let's begin with 1.8, well, I mean, with, uh, the, the question itself, at line 7. And the question says, May, this is February 95 bar, May, has represented the International Bakers Union as its attorney for several years. Okay? So now, May, what you can deduce from that is that May is probably a labor lawyer. You know, or an employment lawyer. Uh, not a criminal lawyer, probably, because she represents the union. 
and she's been representing him for several years. So she has an existing client, and she takes on new clients who are going to watch the conflicts. So she has an existing client, we know that, and we know the kind of work that she does, sort of, we think we know the kind of work she does for this client. Let's continue. Next slide. Last year, while the union was on strike against bakery, well, you see it coming, don't you? Somebody on the picket line is going to get busted. Uh, a car belonging to the owner of bakery was firebombed outside his home. Oh, my goodness, it was even worse than the picket line. So somebody firebombed the owner's car. Line nine, Walter, the vice president, and Frank, an apprentice member, were charged with arson. Oh my goodness. So the state is claiming that Walter and Frank did it. And it's a felony, carrying up to three years in prison. Line 13. The union retained May to represent Walter and Frank in the criminal case. Okay, now, this is the first time that the attorney is doing anything, so this is the first place she could have done something wrong. So she has now been hired to represent Walter and Frank. And so let's see what we have here. So, see, May, she's, number one, May hired to represent, to represent, is that large enough? Walter and Frank, okay? She hired to represent them both. And what issues do we have here? Well, first of all, she's being hired to represent two, two people. Okay, and if she's being hired to represent two people, there's a potential conflict right there. And so she's hired to represent two people, so there's a conflict, so there's a one point seven conflict between Walter and Frank. Now, a Walter and Frank so far there's not a real violation of one point seven because she's been hired to represent them both, but their interests really are not in conflict yet. But anybody who practices criminal law knows that if you try to represent two people arising out of the same criminal transaction, allegedly criminal transaction, you're going to get into trouble. Okay, because sooner or later these people, each person is going to be telling a version of the story that favors them, even though it might disfavor the other person to some extent. So you can't really represent two people who's uh, on the same, uh, two defendants or two plaintiffs, two defendants in particular, in a criminal case that arise out of the same transaction. And so, because the conflict is going to arise. So you look at 1.7 and you point out that they have a con, they don't have a conflict yet, but you see them at your conflict coming, and you look for the exceptions at 1.7b. So 1.7a uh, defines conflict, and 1.7b defines the exceptions. And you, you have a conflict, a potential conflict, you have a potential conflict, and you don't have any exceptions under 1.7b. In addition to this issue that comes up, she's representing both of them, uh, and there's a possible conflict. There is, uh, among other things, uh, the next issue here is, uh, um, is that she competent? See the problem on um, with regard to her competence. You pull out the rule on competence. You have to have knowledge, skill, training, experience, um, and the mental facilities to carry out the representation. And here, it doesn't look like she has any experience doing criminal law. You don't know that. She might have been a criminal lawyer before she went to work for the for uh, the union. But on the facts that we have, it doesn't show in experience, and these people are looking at three years in jail, and so I'm not sure if she's competent. Pull out your rules, and they don't just say she might not be competent, okay? 
What you need here is rule application. Okay, that's how you get the point. Just saying, I'm not sure she's competent because after all, she's only been a labor lawyer and as far as we know, and how's she going to represent these people in a criminal case like this? Well, that's not using any rule, okay? This is using street sense. And the bar is going to give you a license to use rules. So you've got to use rules to so pull out the rule on competence and application. Another problem here, still with this, don't you have a third party payer? You have a third party payer. And uh, because the union is going to pay, pull out your rules for third party payer. You're going to need those. Okay. And so let's continue. Let's see, do we have anything else here yet? I think that's all the conflicts we have so far. We continue. The union hired May to represent Walt and Frank. Shortly after entering her appearance, May was approached by Pete, the prosecutor, okay, who told her that an unidentified member of the executive board would testify that Walter and other members of the leadership planned the firebombing and got Frank to go along with it only after they threatened to revoke his apprenticeship card. Okay, so now you've got some witnesses who want to testify for one client who want to testify on behalf of the uh, of uh, the apprentice, Frank, but their testimony is going to help Frank, but it's going to hurt Walter. And you're trying to represent them both? Well, you now have an actual conflict. So the second thing here is Pete's prosecutor and when Pete's statements have been brought in, what do we have here? We now have an actual conflict. Again, bring out your rules. Don't bring out your common sense. Okay, nobody wants, or you don't need to go to law school to get common sense. And the bar examiners are not testing you for that. Uh, bring out the rules uh, on the actual conflict so that you got one. And application, rule application, not common sense. Uh, and you have an actual conflict. Um, also, this is an offer. Uh, the let's keep reading. So it says. Uh, so he says this is what they're going to testify to. And now we pick we pick up line 17. Pete continues line 17. Pete said that if Frank would testify for the prosecution against Walter, whoa, you talk about a conflict, that Peter would allow Frank to plead guilty to a misdemeanor and recommend probation. So you really have an actual conflict. No question about it. But this is an offer. And this offer has to be taken back to your client, both clients. So this you must need to communicate the offer to the client. It's to both clients, because so she's representing them both at this point. And remember that in the criminal case, we have it right here on this board, 2-200, in a criminal case, you must, uh, I'm sorry, it's not there. Criminal case, the uh, uh, information is that, is that one point way back here. Communications, remember this one? Communications, that you have to communicate. In a criminal case, you must communicate all offers to the client, whether you think it's a great one or not. And civil cases are all meaningful offers. And so he has to communicate this offer. And right now, she's representing both of them. So she's got to, she's got to communicate this offer to both clients. Okay? And uh, again, do it. Don't just say, you know, in all fairness, she really ought to communicate this offer to both clients. That's crap. Don't do that. Okay, give them a rule. And cite the rule about communicating and say, here, you know, she's got these clients, and so do it. So do it by rule application. Don't do it any other way. She has to communicate it. Not only that, she cannot represent them now because the client, the conflict, she needs to withdraw. The conflict is too direct. So she needs to withdraw. And
And since she is going to withdraw, she must, since she's going to withdraw their rules about withdrawing. We didn't uh, get to 3-700, but if you look at 3-700, you're going to read all of the article of chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 of the California rules. I'm sure you are. But when you read 3-700, it says if you're going to, it says there's certain circumstances where you must withdraw, and that's the 3-700A. Then in 3-700B, it says if you're going to withdraw, here's some precautions you have to take. You have to make sure you don't injure the client by your withdrawing. And do it, and then you have to notify the tribunal if you've made an appearance already. Here, May has made an appearance. So she has to go to the court and make her withdrawal known to the court, get permission to withdraw in fact. And the reasons for which you, there are mandatory reasons and permissive reasons to withdraw. One of the permissive reasons, of course, is where you, um, the client's not paying the bill. But mandatory reasons are where you've got this kind of a conflict. And so she's got to withdraw. And you do you pull out 3-700, pull out, use 3-700 to say she's going to withdraw, here's some things she's got to do. So let's continue. Uh, the uh, line 19, both Walter and Frank, pardon me, line 19, may immediately refuse. Well, she broke the rule because she's supposed to notify, she immediately refused because she's supposed to notify the lawyer that um, she's supposed to notify the uh, um, uh, she, uh, notify the client about this offer. She didn't notify them. She refused. Turned it down right then. Okay, bad news. Continuing line 19, she refused, telling Pete that she knows he's just a union buster, and that her union would suffer if she agreed to this proposal. Well, it looks to me like she's looking out for the union now. So you have still another conflict. Okay? She is um, uh, looking out for the union, that's her former, her present client, over the two present clients that she's got. She's got Walter, Frank, and the union. And she's picking the union as first to represent them. And so if her interest, if the union's interest, who she's already representing, and the client's interests she's starting to represent are in conflict, she has to withdraw. She should withdraw from representing the, the clients, the two clients. So that's another reason for a withdrawal. We now have another conflict uh, with the union being a party to the conflict. And then they ask you what rights of any, you know, what, uh, uh, what uh, professional responsibility rules has you violated, and that's how you would handle that problem. Let's look at uh, Another problem, uh, another problem, the, um, the, um, got the most issues that will be useful for us. Let's take the one from July 02. The July 02 exam, the name of it is A Favor for Betty. July 02, A Favor for Betty. Let's go through this one in the same way. Uh, I'm going to ultimately erase this board and use it, and so if you want material off there, you should take that. The uh, and again, I the third, the, the last conflict down here, the conflict that May has because the union, she is now favoring the union over these two clients, that's a third conflict. And that is not on the board for lack of space, so don't leave it off your notes. Put it in there. July 02, beginning. Betty is a prominent real estate broker. Okay, and she's asked her attorney friend, Alice, so what we know so far is that Alice is a lawyer. Erase this. So she has um, 
Uh, Alice is a lawyer, and she wants her to represent her 18-year-old son, Todd, who is being prosecuted for a drug possession with intent to distribute. Now, it looks like Betty is asking Alice to represent Todd, so right away you see the issue. Well, the first issue you see, this by the way, is a February 02 question. February 02 professional responsibility question. So, first of all, you see that it looks like uh, Betty is hiring Alice to represent Todd. So it's obvious that she has a third party payer. Now, no one I think is foolish enough to believe that what I'm saying to you is that right now you should start writing about third party payers. Okay. What we're doing is identifying issues as we go through and I'm uh, assuming that you have the good judgment to write the issues according to what you have. But this is, you already you see the problem that is coming up. And you, you almost have to do it this way to identify the issues from the various parts of the question and then organize your answer according to what they ask. Next, Betty told Alice that she wanted to get the matter resolved as quickly as possible. Well, you got the third party payer, and the problem is here are you need consent. You need consent from Todd. You need don't tell don't let Betty control the case. I'm abbreviating here at the board and don't give Betty any secret information or confidential information, whichever you want to call it. Uh, now, so we see that coming up and you see already in this problem that Alice says, I want this resolved as quickly as possible and she's telling you that I, I want to control the case. I want you to do it uh, for my convenience. And so that, that's going to come up in your answer someplace, continuing. Betty also told Alice that she could make arrangements with a secure inpatient drug rehab center to accept Todd, that she wanted Alice to recommend it to Todd. Well, should Alice recommend that to Todd because his mother thinks that's what's good for him? No, she's representing Todd. And so once again, you have Alice trying to control the case in a second way. She wants it over with, apparently, to keep the publicity down. And this is what she wants done with the case. Uh, you see the problems already. If you don't write about those, that would be a bad score. Continuing, we are now at line 10. Although Alice had never handled a criminal case, okay, there you have it, competence, okay, uh, and um, this is... Uh, Clear you have a, this is our first case, and this is our, this is a competent. And, you know, don't just say to the bar examiners, this is her first case, and I really doubt that she knows how to do it. Okay, that's sweet stuff. Okay, do you want a license? Give them rule. An application. Tell them what the rule is and apply the rule. And that's why you think she may not be competent. And the rule is if a person is not competent, you can, you can handle cases that you're not competent to handle, but the rule is that if you're not competent, then you either get competent, if you have time to do that, or uh, either you need to be competent or get competent or uh, uh, associate with somebody who is. Once again, the requirements are either be competent, get competent, or associate with somebody who is. And that's the situation that Betty, that uh, Alice has at this point. She is not competent. 
uh, she agreed to represent Todd and accepted a retainer from Betty. So you see that Betty is paying the bill. Second paragraph. Alice called her law school friend Zelda, an experienced criminal lawyer. Well, that's fine. She's going to associate with Zelda. No problem. But remember, if you're going to associate with somebody, you are now bringing another lawyer into the act, and there's some rules about that. If you're going to bring another lawyer in, you need consent from the, uh, if you're going to associate with another lawyer, you need consent from the client. You need, uh, 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 in writing, you need consent from the client. You need, um, the, uh, uh, you need, um, to, uh, to associate with a new lawyer. You need uh, consent from the client. You need to, uh, you need to have it in writing. Uh, you need, uh, the fees need to be in proportion to work done unless both clients take responsibility for the outcome. And the client, uh, has to, uh, has to know about it. consent in writing. No increase in fees just because you got more lawyers in the act. And the fee must continue to be reasonable or not unconscionable, depending on you looking at the ABA rules. The fees must be reasonable. California rules, they must not be unconscionable. So Alice uh, is called her friend Zelda. And Zelda sent Alice copies of her standard discovery motions. Well, that's good. That's good. That's not even associating with some other lawyer yet. She just sent her some copies of the motion. Zelda and Alice then interviewed Todd. Well, now, wait a minute. Uh, Alice is bringing Zelda into the act, and you need to get Todd's consent and um, in writing to do that. And this hasn't happened yet, so she should have done that. Uh, Alice introduced Zelda as her associate. Well, if someone is your associate, that means that the person is working with you in the case. Okay. A consultant is somebody you bring in to consult with. An associate is someone that you are, are working with or sharing fees with or something where you both are working on this case. I'm not sure she's an associate. Okay, I think she is more a consultant, but let's go ahead. Maybe she's going to associate with Zelda. Let's see. Alice introduced Zelda as her associate. Todd denied possessing, selling, or even using drugs. Oh my, so Todd says, I am totally innocent. Todd said he was set up by undercover officers. Okay, so he says, I didn't do it. Line 16. After Todd left the office, Zelda told Alice that if Todd's story was true, the prosecution's case was weak, and there was a strong entrapment case. Well, and so what it looks like is that we have a strong entrapment case, a weak case for the prosecution. Todd says, I didn't do it. And the mother says, I want him put into a rehab center. Okay. Well, don't follow the mother's advice. Talk to Todd. Let's keep going. Line 17. Alice then told Zelda that she, Alice, could take it from here. Well, I don't think she can take it from here. Uh, it's her first criminal case. It's a serious, I mean, you know, distributing drugs. That's, you know, like 10 years in jail or something. She's not ready to take that case. And so she says, I can take it here and gave her a check marked consultation fee, Betty's case. Well, that means that she didn't really associate with Zelda. She led Todd to believe she was associating with Zelda, who was kind of an expert, but uh, she didn't really associate with Zelda. She just consulted with Zelda. And she is now taking a case which she clearly is not competent to handle. So that's our next issue there. She, after consulting with Zelda, she's still incompetent to handle this case, and she's taking it anyway. And she paid Betty a consulting fee. They're not bringing her on as a associate. Continue, line 21. Alice entered an appearance for Todd 
on God's behalf and filed discovery motions. Well, that's good, showing that she was the only defense counsel. So she did not associate with Zelda. And he points this out to the bar examiner. She did not associate with Zelda, and so she still, uh, if she's not competent, and she's not, she needs to either get competent or, or associate. She hasn't done, gone back to school or anything to get competent, so she needs to associate with somebody who is, and she's not doing that. She just consulted with somebody. Line 24. At a subsequent court appearance, the prosecutor offered to reduce the charge to a simple felony possession and to agree a simple felony possession. So he's not distributing, but he's still going to be convicted of a felon, felony and he's going to be a, a convicted drug felon the rest of his life. It's not very cool. And reduce it to a simple possession and to agree to a period of probation on the condition that Todd undergo one year of inpatient drug rehab. Well, uh, Todd doesn't want to do that. Todd says, I'm innocent. And they're offering him a deal. Uh, the Alice asked Todd what he thought about this, so she presented the deal to him as she should have, and Todd responded, look, I'm innocent. You see the problem. He says, I want to prove I'm innocent. And she wants to do what the payer mother is asking her to do. But let's keep going. Line 27, look, I'm innocent. Don't I have any other choice? You see that? He wants to go to trial, apparently. The next line. Based on Alice's advice, Todd accepted the prosecutor's offer, entered a plea guilty, and was sentenced, sentence was imposed. Well, you see what happened here. You've got the real issues of the third party payer and um, letting the third party, doing what the payer wanted her to do instead of what Todd wanted her to do. And they asked if Alice has violated any rules. And the answer is yes, she's violated a whole bunch of rules. Identify the rules that she has violated, give the rule, and then the application. Don't give your common sense, recite the rules. That's why you need to read the rules and to know as best you can exactly what they say. Use the language of the rule as best you can and then apply the rule. But do not apply your common sense. Okay. Um, uh, please, in your final preparation for the bar, I urge you to do uh, one more thing besides the things we've talked about. And that one more thing is that I would like for you to look at a lot of questions and answers where you're looking at the answers published by the bar or any answer that has been prepared by someone who knows what they're doing, a bar review course answer or something. I look at a bunch of questions and answers. Uh, you may use my questions and answers if you want, but there's a problem there, and that is that there's a great deal of teaching material in a lot of my answers because I use them for that purpose. And what you really want to see is answers that have been cut down to just what you can do for the bar in about a thousand words, because that's all you get. About a thousand words, good use of the facts, good statement of rules in those thousand words. One good place to look for those is, the, is online because the bar examiners have lots of published answers online. So I'm encouraging you, asking you, promoting, that you look online and read. If you look, when you do your review of uh, crimes, look at a bunch of crimes questions. Look at the question thrown out from the bar. Look, read the question, outline what you would like, then look at the published answer. Two, there's usually two published answers. Look at them both and see how different they are. Again, look at the next answer. Try to do this with as much as many as a half a dozen questions for each of, uh, each of the subjects on the bar. And if you have done that, you will not only have written a lot from their work in this course, which I hope you did, but you also have seen, uh, been exposed to a lot of fact patterns and how those fact patterns are analyzed. 
when you read the published answer, when you read the published answer, don't just read it and say how interesting. Read the published answer and identify how the rule was stated. There's a rule in these answers. There's a rule and the application. So look, pull out the rule, see that the rule was given. Second, notice in the application of the rule how that there are several places in the answer where there, or there were points of contention where the writer says one side will say this about these facts, that they are sufficient. The other side will say this about the facts, saying that they are not sufficient. So pay attention and identify and locate the points of contention in these problems. And finally, please notice how much is written. People who are writing five and six hundred word answers, when you read these answers published by the bar, you'll see that they're twelve, thirteen hundred words long. And uh, you can't pass them with five and six hundred words. Okay, you can get by with a thousand, but try to get at least that much done. If you're typing, you can get a thousand words down there. If you're handwriting, you're going to end up with between 900 and 1,000. And so you had a little bit of a disadvantage, but there's still an awful lot of the papers that are handwritten and do pass. The bar examiners still contend that there is no significant difference in the percentage of people who pass with handwritten answers versus the percentage of people who pass with typed answers. I'm not sure I believe that anymore, but they're still saying that. So you can do well. If your handwriting, according to them, you can do just as well. But still, you've got to get rule application in there, and please do that. So can do the practice exam this coming week. This coming week, when you do the practice exam, treat it like the real exam. Do not treat it like homework. That's insane. You've been doing homework. This is time to make a switch. Treat it like the bar. Start at 9 o'clock, just like you would the bar. At 10 o'clock, in the paper. Don't not keep writing. And start the next one and so forth. Send us the papers right away so we can start grading them. Start your PT at 1 o'clock. Finish it at 4 o'clock. Send it to us for grading. Do that. Stay on time. Stay on time. Stay on time. The, again, the exam papers will be given priority. People who are sending in homework and stuff that's one, two, three weeks old, we will, we will grade it as fast as we can, but please understand that's going to get a lower, much lower priority. The um, uh, stay on time, um, start on time, be serious about this, treat it like the real bar, read lots of questions and answers in each of the areas on the bar, use the bar questions and answers, they are good examples. Um, and with that, uh, you should do well on the exam. You can follow the instructions, do well. One last thing I want to tell you. On the multiple choice, I've said this before, but I want to say it one more time. On the multiple choice part of the exam, that when you're doing the multiple choice question, every answer that you end up with, either your correct answer or you found the correct answer by looking in the back of your book, when you have the correct answer, you need to understand that that correct answer, that answer is correct because of a rule of law, a completely stated rule of law, in the use of these facts on that rule that gives you this answer and no other answer. Okay? Rule application. If you chose your answer because this answer is more law-like or it's more fact-like or it's longer or it just sounds better. Any of that kind of stuff. If you pick it on those bases, those are guesses. And the bar examiners have set these answers up in such a way that you arrive at the correct answer by knowing what the rule is that's being tested and using these facts against that rule. So even if you don't get the answer right by doing that, once you know what the right answer is, be sure you take the time to understand it in that way, because that's the way the question is designed. They're not designed by which answer is more law-like or more fact-like or longer or, or, or they use fancy law words or whatever. Okay. It's done rule application. That's the way the answer, the, the 
problems are constructed when they are pre-tested. They are pre-tested with these standards in mind. What rule? What is the rule? And if you use these facts, do you get to that? And only that answer. Be sure to go to the trouble to understand your MBE questions in that way. That's how you get the high score. And with those final tips, please do well on the practice exam, and uh, we will look forward to seeing your papers.